The subject we are to consider this evening is a vital subject. Our appreciation of this subject can affect whether we get eternal life or we might not get eternal life. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ had to say about this matter in a prayer to the Father, as is recorded in John chapter 17 and verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And so, you see, what you believe on this subject is very, very important because it has the potential to affect your eternal welfare. The very basis upon getting eternal life depends on us knowing God, knowing him truly, worshipping him in spirit and in truth. And ladies and gentlemen, you can't worship something which is incomprehensible. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. Now in the scripture reading, which our chairman read for us a moment ago, there's a clear, simple statement about God and Jesus Christ. And so in verse 5 of 1 Timothy chapter 2 we read, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Now there's a simple, clear statement which anyone can understand. There is one God and there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And you know, the Apostle Paul made that statement long after the Lord Jesus Christ had ascended into heaven. Paul makes that statement while Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. And he describes Christ as the man. He says there's one God, he is in heaven, there's men upon the earth and there's the Lord Jesus Christ with the Father in heaven as a mediator between God and men. Now you contrast that with the incomprehensible doctrine of the Trinity. Now this is how it is set out in the common book of prayer of the Church of England. And as we go through this, just see if you can comprehend these words, understand what they are saying. This is how, as I say, it is set out in the common book of prayer of the Church of England. So the Father is God, <coughs> the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God, and yet they're not three gods but one God. So likewise, the Father is Lord, the Son Lord, and the Holy Ghost Lord and yet not three lords, but one lord. For like as we are compelled by the Christian verity to acknowledge every person by himself to be both God and Lord, so we are forbidden by the Catholic religion to say there be three gods or three lords. So the Bible is clear. There's one God, there's one Lord Jesus Christ, his son, but the common book of prayer says, we are compelled by the Christian verity to acknowledge every person by himself to be both God and Lord, and yet we are forbidden by the Catholic religion to say there are three gods or three lords. So as we saw from 1 Timothy chapter 2 and at verse 5, there is one God, there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, Compare that with that incomprehensible statement as set out in the Church of England Common Book of Prayer. There's no doubt about the fact that the Trinity is an incomprehensible doctrine. So in the first part of our lecture this evening, we will see that, and we're going to deal with the incomprehensibleness of the doctrine. We're going to show, God willing, that it is illogical, that it's biblical, unsustainable, and, in a word, wrong. Now you might say to me, well, how did the doctrine of the Trinity develop? And perhaps in this short statement taken from the questions and answers um, in How Can God Be Both One and Three by Leonard Hodgkinson, Hodgkins, Hodgkinson, DD, he says on page five, the Jewish doctrine of God 
the Jewish doctrine of God. And ladies and gentlemen, this book is a Jewish book in the sense that it has come down to us, to the Jewish nation, the Jewish people. The Jewish doctrine of God was not Trinitarian. When they said, as they do in Deuteronomy, or as is recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, the Lord our God is one Lord, it meant for the Jews that he that is God was to be thought of as one person, one person, unipersonal. On page 7, the book says, it was impossible for original Christians to give up the belief that God is one. Those of Jewish origin could not be disloyal to the first article of their ancestral creed. And as the, church, as the church moved out into the Gentile world and began to examine its thought in the light of Greek philosophy, it found that for thinking men, only monotheism, God is one, is rationally credible. Yet God, they say, had made himself known as free. What were they to do? They tried various experiments, says this book. They tried thinking of God as a single person who appeared in different forms, as one man might be, for example, a soldier, a statesman, a poet. This, which is called modernism, was rejected as not taking sufficient account of the gospel evidence of personal relations between father and son. They tried keeping the unity by thinking of the father alone as God in his own right, and the Son and Spirit as divine in a secondary sense. This subordination was also rejected as disallowing the worship that they felt bound to address to both the Son and Spirit. Their condition was one which recurs over and over again in the history of human knowledge, when the evidence of newly discovered facts will not fit into the existing forms of thought. For the time being, says this article, for the time being, says this article, which supports the Trinity, the best that can be done is to adopt an attitude of suspended judgment, even though this involves the assertion of apparent contradictions. This is what was done in the passage quoted from the document originally attributed to St. Uh, Anathasius. And that, of course, is what I quoted to you a moment ago from the Church of England Common Book of Prayer. The best that can be done, okay, is to adopt an attitude of suspended judgment. Now, you compare that with what the Lord Jesus Christ said. This is eternal life to know the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. So, in summary, thus far, what we have find, found is this. The admitted facts by Trinitarian apologists, that is, people who argue in favour of the Trinity, is that the doctrine of the Trinity is incomprehensible. It cannot be rationally explained. Secondly, for 4,000 years before about AD 350, faithful worshippers knew nothing about the Trinity. They were monotheists, believing in one God. The third point, New Testament believers knew nothing about it. The fourth point, suspended judgment is required concerning it. All right, well, that's what the world says. That's what people who believe in the Trinity say. What does the Bible say? Because that is what concerns us. What does the Bible say? And the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, is very, very clear. There is only one God. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, we have this statement. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Quite plain. And the Jewish people understood by that that God was a unit, a person. Not three persons in one, but a person. The Lord our God is one Lord. In Isaiah chapter 45, verses 5 and 6, 
we read where God says, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Now you might like to open your Bibles, and we'll just look at a couple of other verses in Isaiah chapter 45, where that idea, which we have just seen from verses 5 and 6, is reinforced. So, for example, if we come to Isaiah 45 and verse 18, in the same chapter we've just quoted from on the slide, this is what verse 18 says of Isaiah 45. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He had established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. Verse 21. Tell ye and bring men near Yea, let them take counsel together who hath declared this from the ancient from ancient time, who hath told it from that time. Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Saviour. There is none beside me. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none else. So, when we come to the New Testament, to Mark chapter 12, and between verses 29 and 34, and Jesus answered him, and the hymn was a scribe, and Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other beside he. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God, and no man after that durst ask him any questions. So the Lord said to this scribe, yes, you have answered correctly. There is one God and there is none other than he. Now I've given a couple of other quotes on the slide, which for the sake of time I haven't, won't turn up at the moment. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 6 and 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16 will verify the same facts. Now ladies and gentlemen, just let's look at the logic of this for the moment. You know, a son, a son cannot be co-eternal with his father. It's an impossibility. A son has to be younger than his father because that's what the term means. Have you ever seen a son who's older than his father or the same age as his father? Of course not. It's illogical. It's an impossibility. The very fact that a person is a son means that there is someone older who has been his father. And the Bible describes Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Let's have a look. Well, we can take it from, on, from the slide, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 17. And lo, this is God speaking about his Son. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And you can check the same uh, facts in Matthew 17 and verse 5. Mark 1 and verse 1, Luke 1 and verse 35. Jesus Christ, the Bible sets forth as the Son of God. Logically, he cannot be co-equal and co-eternal with his Father because that's just an impossibility. If he's a son, then there has to be someone older who is his Father. And you know, even after the Lord Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, the Bible still describes Jesus Christ as having a father. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3 we read, Blessed be God, 
even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. Now when the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, the Lord Jesus Christ had long ascended into heaven. And yet the Apostle Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you see, there is the Father, God himself. And then he has a son, Jesus Christ, which as we've already seen in the New Testament, even after Christ has ascended into heaven, is still described as a man. All right? So the other thing is this. A person, we've just seen, haven't we, that if a person has a father, it's impossible for the son to be the same age as the father or to be co-equal with the father or co-eternal with the father. But in the, in the same manner, in the, in, in the same uh, in the same uh, line of thinking, a person who has a God cannot be co-equal with his God. Now you think about it in terms of your own life. You wanted to pray to someone, you want to pray to someone who's got the same power and the same intellect and the same capacity as you? When you use the word God, isn't it a fact that that implies that you are praying or addressing someone who is far greater than you, greater capacity. And so a person who has a God cannot be co-equal with his God. He can't be the same age. He can't have the same capacity, the same power, the same intellect. And so the word God implies superiority. If you're going to pray to a God, you're praying to someone who is superior to you. And yet, when the Lord Jesus Christ ascended to heaven and the apostles wrote the epistles, they said that Jesus Christ still has a God. So we read, for example, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So Paul says, even when Christ is in heaven, he has a God, you see. He has a God, someone far greater, someone far more important than himself. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 17, <clears throat> that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, said the Apostle Paul, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So again, the Apostle Paul talks about Christ, talks about Jesus Christ as having a God. Even when he's in heaven, he is not co-equal with his Father. And you could find the same idea set out in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. Let us now come and consider the facts concerning Jesus Christ. And the first fact we want to consider is that Jesus Christ is a man, and that is how he is described in the New Testament. So in Acts 2, chapter 2 and verse 32 we read, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man, approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves know. In the verse which we've already looked at this evening, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So you see, whether Jesus Christ is on earth or whether he is in heaven, he is still described as the man or a man. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. The fact that we are able under certain conditions to be resurrected, that fact that Belief that understanding of things came through the work of Jesus Christ. For since by man, that is by Adam, came death, by man, that is by Jesus Christ, came also the resurrection of the dead. This is how the Bible describes our Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps you might turn with me to Romans chapter 5 
and verse 15, and we'll just take another verse in this same vein as the ones we've already looked at. Romans chapter 5 and verse 15. But not as the offence, so also is the free gift. For if through the offence of one, that is the offence of Adam, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, that is by Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So you see, Adam is described as a man, and in that verse, Jesus Christ is also described as a man. When we come to the Bible, we find when it talks about the conception of the Lord Jesus Christ, it talks about his birth, and then it talks about his developing as he grew in age. And so the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ grew in wisdom and learned obedience. Ladies and gentlemen, is that idea compatible with Jesus Christ being part of a trinity? With Jesus Christ being God in the sense that the Father in heaven is God? Not at all. So in Luke chapter 2 and verse 52 we read, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8, Though he were a son, and this is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Is it appropriate to describe a person who is, according to the churches, most churches, most so-called Christian churches, is it, a, is it appropriate to describe a person of the Trinity as they believe it? Is it appropriate to think that he learned obedience he learned obedience by the things that he suffered? No, of course it's not. The Lord Jesus Christ was a man. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He, as he developed in his life, he increased in wisdom and in favour with God and man, and he learned obedience by the things which he experienced in life. And so the Bible is insistent that Jesus Christ was made like his brethren. In other words, he was born of Mary, he was a person of flesh and blood. So in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 we read, that when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ was a man, he was a human. He was a person of flesh and blood, as you and I are people of flesh and blood. Although, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ had a greater capacity than you and I have because of his miraculous conception. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14, we read, For as much then as the children, that's our souls, are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. As we have already said, he was born of the Virgin Mary. He was flesh and blood. He was a human. Wasn't part of a trinity which somehow miraculously uh, was conceived in Mary and brought forth. That's not what the Bible teaches, you see. It teaches that he was a man. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17. Wherefore in all things... It behoved him that it, it behoved Jesus Christ to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So you see, the Bible teaches clearly that the Lord Jesus Christ is a man. Now, not only that, but being a man and being affected by the sin which Adam brought into the world and the consequences which that sin had, being a man, the Lord Jesus Christ needed saving out of death. Now you think about this, ladies and gentlemen. Is it possible to conceive an idea which says part of the Trinity needed saving from death? Does that make sense to you? Is that logical? Is that something which the Bible sets out, sets out? Not at all. What the Bible sets out is that the Lord Jesus Christ, being a man of flesh and blood, 
being a descendant of Adam through Mary, he needed saving out of death, as we need saving out of death. So in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7, we read this. Speaking of Christ, it says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him, that is, unto God, who was able to save him from death. God was able to save him was from death. And Christ prayed that he might be saved out of death. And Paul says, as he writes, writes to the Hebrews, that Christ was heard in that, he's feared, in that he feared. God heard him. God saved him out of death. Does that line up with the ideas which we have seen set forth that Jesus Christ, false ideas, that Jesus Christ was part of the Trinity? Now in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12 we read, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. Now I know that the authorised version has the end of that verse for us. But the construction of the Greek is a construction which means that what happened here was that what Christ did, he did for himself. And so most or many versions omit the words for us because they are inappropriate. They are against the Greek text, the meaning of the Greek text. And so what that verse teaches is the Lord Jesus Christ obtained redemption. He obtained redemption through his own sacrifice. Is that your concept or the church's concept of the Trinity? It's impossible, isn't it? See, the Bible doesn't teach that Jesus Christ is God the Son doesn't teach that at all. It teaches that Jesus Christ was a man, a very special man, most certainly. All right? A very certain man, a, a very special man. And it teaches that Jesus Christ, being a descendant of Adam, as we are descendants of Adam, needed saving out of death once he had died. Now the point is this, that Jesus Christ wherever you look in the Bible, is always subordinate to God, his Father. God was both God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And wherever you go, you'll find the Bible teaches that Christ is subordinate to God and his Father. While on earth, we read in Mark chapter 13 and verse 32, But of that day and hour know no man, know not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. And so we're talking about a time when Christ was going to return. And Christ says, well, I don't know when it is. I don't know when it, I don't know when it is. He says, of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, the angels don't know. They were in heaven, they don't know. I'm the Son, but I don't know. The only person that knows, said the Lord Jesus Christ, is the Father. And after he had ascended into heaven, he still didn't know all things. So in the very opening verse of the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, we read, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him. Now, ladies and gentlemen, does that sound like Christ was part of a trinity? That he knew as much as God? That he was equal with God? Not at all. He didn't have the same knowledge as God. And so God had to tell him certain things. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. So we find that while Christ was on earth, he was subordinate to God. We find after he had ascended into heaven, not only is he described as a man still, but he was clearly subordinate to God and his Father. And in the future, when he returns and he establishes God's kingdom upon the earth, which is the glorious gospel message of the Bible, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 to 28, which is speaking about the situation which will prevail at the end of the 1,000-year reign of Christ upon the earth. That's what Paul is talking about here in 1 Corinthians 15. The Bible teaching is that Christ will return from heaven to earth, establish God's kingdom, rule over the earth for a thousand years, and then at the end of the thousand years, God, uh, Christ rather, will hand over the kingdom to God, having accomplished the Father's purpose on the earth during the period of the kingdom. 
So then, Paul says, speaking of this time at the end of the 1,000 year reign of Christ, then cometh the end when he, that is when Christ shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he, for Christ must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he, that is God, hath put all things under Christ's feet. Now look, if Christ is co-equal and co-eternal and with equal power with God and so forth, why has God got to put all things under Christ's feet? You see, this idea of the Trinity is totally unscriptural and totally illogical. But anyway, Paul says, For he, God, hath put all things under Christ's feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that God is accepted, which did put all things under him. In other words, when God puts all things under Christ, he didn't put himself under Christ's feet. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. And then he says in verse 28, And when all things shall be subdued unto him, that is, under, unto Christ, then shall the Son, that is how he's described, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all and in all. So even after the Lord Jesus Christ has reigned upon the earth for a thousand years, even after the earth has been cleansed, even after death has been completely abolished, even after the purpose of God that the earth should be full with his glory has been established or, and, and, and set up on earth by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, nevertheless, Christ is still subject to God. He's subject to the God that put all things under his feet. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in dealing with this subject, there is a very glorious aspect to it. And that subject, which is related to the one we're dealing with this evening, in fact, is part of the one we're dealing with this evening, is the subject of God manifestation. And God manifestation is a glorious Bible doctrine but because it's misunderstood, then people have conjured up this idea of a trinity, which of course, as I've already said, is not only totally wrong, but totally illogical, all right? And God's purpose with the earth is what we describe as God manifestation. And you might say, well, what does that mean? I've never heard of that before. What does that mean? It simply means this, ladies and gentlemen, that God wants men and women to think like him, to act like him, and eventually to be made immortal like him. So the process is firstly mental. You come to understand God, you understand his purpose, what he wants to achieve in our lives and accomplish in our lives. He wants us to understand the Bible so that we come to think as he thinks and have his standards as our standards. And once we've done that and we understand God's standards and what he wants, then we're able to act like him. In other words, we gain the knowledge, we find out what God wants, we put that into action. So we first must think like God, we must then act like God because we know what God wants, and then when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to establish the kingdom on the earth, if we have been successful in that as far as possible we think like God and we act like him, then when Christ returns we can be made immortal. And immortality, of course, is only derived from God himself. So the, first, the process is mental, thinking like God, moral, acting like God, and then in God's plan and purpose with the earth, men and women who do that successfully will be made immortal like God. That's what we mean by God manifestation. So this is God's purpose with the earth. And this is what a Christadelphian said about that in 1858. He said, men and women, if you like, men and women were not ushered into being for the purpose of being saved or lost. God manifestation not human salvation was the great purpose of the eternal spirit. We want salvation, that's a natural thing. If you are a dying creature, if you are mortal and sin prone, then you want salvation. We all want salvation. Every person in this room wants salvation. So that's our point of view. 
but God's got a point of view which is not the same as that. God's purpose, God wants the earth to be populated with the people who are like him. So he didn't bring men and women into the purpose for the purpose of being saved into, 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 into being for the purpose of being saved or lot lost. He brought men and women into being that they might manifest his character, that they might think like him, that they might act like him, and ultimately be immortal like him. And in the end, all the world's population will be of that class of people, people who think like God, people who act like God, and people who have been made immortal. And this Bible doctrine supplies a complete answer to the texts which are rested to support the false idea of the Trinity. So bear in mind that the Bible talks, it doesn't use the word, but it talks about God manifestation. And we've seen how we have got to manifest God. We've got to gradually think like God, act like God, and then when Christ returns to establish the kingdom, we hope to be made immortal like God. Now, that being the case, of course, here is God's purpose with the earth, as it is set out, for example, in Numbers 14 and verse 21. But as truly as I live, this is God speaking, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. The whole earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. And you might say, oh, what's the glory of the Lord? Well, we get a clue in Romans chapter 5 and verse 2, where the Apostle Paul says, by whom, that is by Jesus Christ also, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. In other words, the hope which the Bible sets before you and me, ladies and gentlemen, is the hope of being made immortal. The hope of being made immortal, and we've described the process. Think like God, act like God, and ultimately be made immortal like God. That is God's glory. And in the end, all the world's population will manifest the glory of God because they will think like God, act like God, and be immortal like God. So what this means is that God's purpose, that the earth will be populated with people, as I say, who think like him, who act like him, and who are immortal like him, will be populated by people who are like God. And that purpose, God has memorialised in his name when speaking of himself in Hebrew, which is the Old Testament, the Old Testament was originally handed down to us through the Jewish nation and was handed down in Hebrew. We read in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14 where it says, Aya, Asha, Aya. And the meaning there is when God is speaking of himself, I will be who I will be. Now, we've spoken about God manifestation, we've spoken about God's purpose, that men and women might think and act like God and be made immortal like God. And God, as he expresses it, he says, I will be who I will be. In other words, God is going to manifest himself in people so that they do exactly that. They think like God, they act like God, they're immortal like God. I will be who I will be. In other words, when a person does that, when that being made immortal, and that someone looks upon them, they will see God's character revealed. A person will think like God, act like God, be immortal like God, have a portion of God's power, be able to perform miracles and do, do, do various other things. And so, I will be who I will be expresses God's purpose of developing in others his character, and giving them his immortal nature. That's God speaking. I will be who I will be. But when that's memorialised in a name and to be used by others when addressing God, we can't say, I will be who I will be, can we, when we're addressing God? So the I has to become he. He will be, be who he will be. He who will be manifested. So when we address God by his name, by his memorial name, we are acknowledging the fact that God's purpose is to manifest himself in others, to develop people who think and act like God and are immortal like, like God. 
So when memorialised in a name to be used by others when addressing God, the I will, I will be becomes he will be, and Aya becomes, Asha, Aya becomes Yahweh. Yahweh is the God who will manifest himself in others. Now you see, once you get that concept, ladies and gentlemen, then if you find other people being described as God, you're not going to jump to the conclusion that they're part of the Trinity. That's the importance of this subject. That's the importance of this doctrine. God's purpose is he wants people to be like him. He wants people to manifest his values, his character. He wants eventually them to be immortal like him. And once you understand that, then because a person is described as God doesn't mean he's God himself, it doesn't mean he's part of the Trinity, it simply means he is a person who is manifesting God's character. That's what it means, manifesting God's power. So Jesus Christ was a manifestation of God, but he wasn't part of the Trinity. Any more that you and I can be part of the Trinity, but God wants us to manifest his character. Concerning Jesus Christ, we read in John chapter 5 and verse 19, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also the Son doeth. Likewise, so that the Lord says, Look, what I do, I know what my Father does, I know how he acts, I know how he thinks, so I follow him. I do what he would do in the circumstances uh, in which I find myself. John, or, yes. John chapter 14 and verse 9. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long with you, uh, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He was able to say he, to Philip, He that hath seen me, Philip, hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou, Show us the Father? So you see what the Lord was saying. He wasn't saying I'm part of the Trinity. He was saying that in my life I have come to think like God. I have come to act like God. And after his resurrection, of course, he was made immortal like God. But because he reflected the Father's values in his life, because he thought like the Father, because he acted as the Father would act in the circumstances in which he found himself, he's able to say to Philip, Philip, he that has seen me has seen the Father because I'm simply reflecting in my life a manifestation of the Father. I'm reflecting his values. And so he's able to say in John chapter 10 and verse 30, I and my Father are one. Not one as part of the Trinity. One in outlook. One in purpose. That is the idea. Not, not The Lord was not saying, well, I'm part of a Trinity. I'm part of one in that sense. That's not what he was saying. He is saying in outlook, in purpose, in, in thought, in, and so forth, I and my Father think exactly the same. Now, in the Bible, and not only in the Bible, but you find this in the world as well, there is the principle of agency. And that principle is that that, that one does by another, he does himself. That which one does by another, he does himself. And so what you find is that God has authorised and empowered others to act for him and to act in his name. Now let's take a, a, a little practical example of this from everyday life. Suppose you want to pay your electricity bill or you've got a problem with your power supply or whatever and, and you ring up this dial this number and someone says electricity board or whatever they say, a litter or whatever it is, I don't know what it is, but you know, sin energy or whatever it happens to be. They're not sin energy. They're simply the representative of sin energy, the principle of agency. And as I say, God has authorised and empowered others to act for him in his name in exactly the same way as I have just explained about the electricity board. So we read in Exodus 23 verses 20 to 33. Behold, says God, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, 
for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. This angel was going to act in the name of God, with God's power and God's authority. God's authority. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do the, all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversaries. So here was an angel, a special angel, which God was going to place his name in. This angel had been given certain authority to act on God's behalf in certain matters. In the later verse, verse 23, For mine angel shall go before thee, and bring thee in unto the Amorites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Canaanites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and says God, I will cut them off. How did he cut them off? Well, he cut them off by this angel and the influence which the angel had in this particular circumstances. But God was acting on the principle of agency. He was an angel which, upon which he had conferred certain powers and certain authority. And so immortal angels are another manifestation of God. Jesus Christ was a manifestation of God and that he thought like God and he acted like God when he was upon the earth. Here we've got immortal angels acting like God and for God and in God's name. They bear God's name, these immortal angels, and act for God with his authority and with his power. So others besides God are called God. And as we saw, the Lord Jesus Christ is called God on this very principle, very principle that the Lord Jesus Christ manifested God and that he acted and thought like God and so that people who looked on the Lord Jesus Christ so far as thinking and morality was concerned saw God. And so in John chapter 20 and verse 28, we read, we read and Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. And angels are actually called God. In Genesis 32, verses 24 to 25 and verse 30, we read, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, that is, the angel touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Now when you look at that uh, incident as it's recorded for example or referred to in Hosea chapter 12 and verse 4, Hosea says that Jacob wrestled with an angel. But Jacob says I've seen God face to face and Jacob can say that because this angel represented God. Wasn't God himself? wasn't some part of a trinity or anything like that. The angel simply acted with God's authority and God's power. And so I, we told in Genesis that uh, Jacob wrestled with a man. And Jacob himself says, I have seen God face to face. And then Hosea says, well, yes, but it was an angel. Because this is the idea of God manifestation. People acting in God's name with God's authority and God's power. So that is the point. So others besides God are called God. Mortal men are called God. Now I'm not going to go through this because time is going faster I end with, than I am with this talk. But in, Judge, in Exodus rather, chapter 22 verses 8 and 10, what you'll find is that the judges which were set up in Israel and who acted for God in certain matters, and they were, these were mortal men, are actually called Elohim. They're actually called gods. Now, they simply represented God. They acted in, uh, with, in, in his name in, in certain matters, all right? So there again, you get, an, an, and, uh, you, you get an, an illustration of God manifestation. Now, in Psalm 82 and verse 6, you have an example of this. I have said, ye are gods, that is Elohim, and all of you children of the Most High. And the Lord Jesus Christ used this against people in his day were, who were opposed to him. So we read, for example, in John chapter 10, verses 33 to 36, the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou being a man, makest thyself God. So they said, 
they as opposed to the Lord Jesus Christ said, look, you're a blasphemer. You make yourself God. What was the Lord's answer? He took them back to their own scriptures. He took them back, he took them back to the Old Testament. He took them back to those scriptures where mortal men are described in the inspired Bible as being God because they acted for God, because they acted with God's authority and so forth. So we read, Jesus answered them, those that have falsely accused him, Jesus answered them. He said, uh, is it not written in your law? He was taking them back to Psalm 82 and verse 6. Is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods? Then the Lord said, if God called them gods under whom the word of God came, and the scripture, he said, can't be broken. He said to the Jews, you can't expunge this from your scripture. You can't tear out this verse. That's what the Lord was saying. He's saying, look at your own scripture. Look at your own scripture. And you'll find that the God of heaven describes people who act for him in certain circumstances. He describes them as God. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods, quoting Psalm 82 and verse 6. If God in heaven called them gods under whom the word of God came, and the Lord said, and the scripture can't be broken, say ye of him, say ye of me, that I blaspheme, say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and said into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. You see? So there was the Lord's answer. The Lord's answer was, you go to the Old Testament and you'll find mortal men actually called God. And the Lord said, all I have said is that I'm the son of God. All right? So that's what the Lord said. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the glorious message of the Bible is this. You, you can be made equal unto the angels and manifest God in the kingdom of God. Now, as I've already pointed out, this is a process which must start now. We must think like God, we must do our best to act like God, and if when Christ returns to establish God's kingdom upon the earth, we are found to have faithfully done that, then we will be made equal unto the angels. We'll be made immortal. And then we'll not only then think like God, act like God, we'll be immortal like God. And so in Luke 20, in verses 35 and 36, the Lord says this. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world, that is the kingdom of God, and the resurrection from the dead, in the kingdom they neither marry, when they're immortal, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die anymore, you see, they're immortal. Neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. And then in Acts chapter 15 and verse 14, Simeon Peter hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Ladies and gentlemen, in those words there is a marvellous hope for you and me. All right? Because God, the Jewish people having crucified their Messiah, God sent the apostles unto the Gentiles that they might call out of the Gentiles a people for God's name. And of course, if a person bears God's name, then they will think like God, they will act like God, and ultimately be immortal like God. And so when the gospel message goes forth, when we preach from this platform the good news concerning the coming kingdom of God, what we are doing, ladies and gentlemen, is we are drawing attention to this marvellous doctrine, this, God, this doctrine of God manifestation, that God wants to take people, take people like you and me, and to get us to think like him, to act like him, and then when Christ comes to be made immortal like him, and if we do that, then we will indeed be a people for God's name, and God's name will be called upon us, we will be invested with God's name, as the Lord Jesus Christ comes and finds us worthy of a place in the kingdom.